Hey everyone, welcome back to my channel. I'm here today to share with you all the books that I read in May. Um, I had a bit of a smaller reading month than usual. I read eight books, which is still like a lot of books, but um, not as many as I have been reading um, recently or like the rest of the year, just because I was really unwell and spent a lot of time in bed recovering and books weren't the thing that I was interested in doing, which is fine. But I will say that I don't think I read a bad book this month. Sorry if you can hear Tom doing the washing up, by the way, I'm filming this as the sun goes down after dinner. Um, I don't think I read a bad book, which I think is pretty good for um, having a smaller pool of books, but none of them being misses. Um, so let's get started with the books I um, don't have to show you and then we'll talk about the ones I did. So the first book I read was for work. I read Night Crawling by Layla Motley. I I think this is out now if not it's coming out in June sometime this is like a very buzzy book I wrote an essay for the girl let's podcast on this I will link it down below if it's published by the time this goes out but this book is really buzzy because the author penned it or started to write it even before she turned 18 I think only now is she maybe 19 and as it's coming out to publish with a big five house she's an American writer and it tells the story of Kira who um is living in a uh, like apartment complex housing estate in Oakland, California, looking after her neighbor's son, like quasi adopted him because the um, mother of that child is um, a drug user and is in and out of the premises and is not around to look after her like 10 year old son. And she's also living with her brother. Her mum is living in a halfway house um, because she has just spent time in prison and her father has um, passed away when she was younger. So it's very much a story of hardship and struggle. It is an intensely bleak book. I would say like that these characters do not catch a break throughout the story. So we follow um, Kira as she begins working as a sex worker in Oakland, firstly on the street, and then she becomes embroiled in this... Um, set of circumstances with involving lots of police officers um which is sexual abuse um by the time we get to the end of the book but she starts out being paid um as a sex worker for them and the story sort of follows in two halves her night life sort of as the book suggests night crawling her life as a sex worker and then her um opportunities in the daytime to try and keep her family afloat her brother's trying to become a rapper and is very disinterested in paying rent and keeping the like a roof over their head he's very focused on like getting his big break kind of thing and so Kira is left to pick up the pieces quite often and she's also caring for this other child and it's a really bleak story that has a naivety to the prose I found and I could feel the age of the author and that isn't to say it read like YA or felt like a immature story it was just so emotionally vulnerable on the page in a way that I think you could only write if you were so young and so um I don't know, he has such fresh eyes to view narration and storytelling from, and I really admired that in its story. I don't, uh, like, agree with the way it's being pushed, like, its merit is being pushed on the way she's such a young author. Like, I think, fundamentally, we shouldn't be judging authors by their age, and, like, to have a debut book at 18 or 81, it doesn't really make a difference, and the way this is being treated is just compounding the idea of ageism and the publishing or just, like, society in general's obsession with youth. So like that, I don't want to participate in it. And, but like, I feel like you have to mention it because her age does come into the way that she tells the story. Her age is not dissimilar to the age of our protagonist. And I think the way she talks about sex work in here is really interesting and nuanced and gives that alternative side of the coin when we're talking about sex work as um, liberative and enjoyable and that fourth wave feminism view on it and I think she does a really good job in here at approaching it from that socio-economic standpoint of destitution and without choice and also the harm and danger that sex workers can come into and I thought that was really really well done in this book it's not necessarily a book I would have um picked up off my own volition I don't think it's very plotty it's very plot driven although there are passages in here that I found particularly beautiful. It is perhaps slightly too earnest for me as a like read for pleasure, but I can like appreciate the craft and the structure of this book. And I really enjoyed reading it like for a work project to write about it. So that is Night Crawling. I'm sure lots of other people this summer will be picking that one up. Then I read The Roles We Play by Sabah Khan. This was like one of the only books I read when I was super, super sick um in May and it's a graphic novel I was sent this by the publisher by Myriad Editions they're a super cool indie 
um, publishing house in Brighton and this book just won the Gillette Prize which is also one of my favourite prizes for celebrating um, authors and I really enjoy this. I'm a graphic novel, graphic memoir fan like in general so I was primed to enjoy this. I know lots of people read the long list or the short list of the prize and were um, just don't consider themselves graphic novel people. I wish I had it here to show you but I lent it to one of my dear friends back in London because I knew how much she would love it and I was really interested in her take on it because it discusses um, Islam and religion a lot in here and the um, author's experience of um, wearing hijab and choosing to take it off and sort of all those conversations about religious dress which is something I talked about with my friends so I wanted her to read it so we could talk about it. So I don't have the gorgeous artwork to show you but I did post some pictures of it on my Instagram if you want to see and it's a really beautiful memoir story. It tells of um, childhood and adolescence, a uh, like turbulent relationship, mother and daughter, and those internal conflicts between religion, morality, um, the outward appearance of religion versus your internal systems and locus of deciding what's wrong and right. And I really loved all those discussions. I thought it was thoughtful and it draw, drew on some really interesting philosophical takes. And I had a really interesting conversation with a couple of my lecturers um, from my undergrad about it because yeah, I thought it was really well done. It has a really soft colour palette of like reds, um, pinks, purples, blues, as you can kind of see from the cover. And that really worked for me. I thought the um, the writing was pared back, but um, enjoyable. And I really like reading graphic novels. I like the artistry of the story being told through pictures. So it really worked for me. So I love that one. And then what I think would be my top read of the month, which I need to find a way to talk about it better because I wrote about it on Patreon, but I would love to write something bigger about it because I think this is such a clever book and that's True Biz by I think it's Sarah or Sarah Novick um they wrote a book Girl at War which I haven't read but I know was very well um received when it came out but this is seems like completely different in terms of plot so um Sarah, Sarah Novick is um a deaf writer and this story is all about deaf culture so it tells the story of a school the river valley school for the deaf and we open with Charlie who is a um, girl who was raised uh, in a speaking like in a non-deaf household and her parents chose to implant her at a young age. There's a lot of conversation in this book about implanting and um, the rights of deaf children and it really dives into the logistics and like you get really in the weeds of um, deaf history and deaf culture and I loved that. I felt like there was no spoon feeding from the author, there was no... Um, there was assumption that if you were reading this book, it was up to you to go and learn about what a cochlear implant is and how they work. And I thought that was brilliant. Like I, I absolutely despise a book, particularly on disability culture that wants to, that tries to address a non-disabled reader. I really thought um, this book was like written for and about deaf people, which I loved. So you follow Charlie as she enters one of the only deaf schools left in her like near vicinity. Her parents are going through a divorce that she partially thinks is her fault. And she is paired up with a boy, Austin, who is from like a legacy deaf family. So he's third or fourth generation deaf. And um, there's he's very well known in the community. His family are very well known. And there's a, um, a prestige, I guess, amongst the students that comes with being from one of these families. And it was a really interesting inversion of um, privilege and... I just really like that discussion on that like very specific experience of um, being from a deaf family versus being from a hearing family and I thought it was really um, interesting to understand those dynamics. So they're paired up together and a friendship slash romance blossoms and within that every chapter, I wish I had a physical copy, I'm definitely going to buy one, I read it um, on my Kobu, there are um, intersections that explain ASL, we get confused because obviously in England it's BSL, but ASL sign language and they explain sort of hand movements and gestures and to the reader as well as we watch Charlie and her dad learn sign language because Charlie was raised in a hearing household, she didn't learn sign language because there was a belief among hearing culture and in general society that deaf children shouldn't learn sign language because that stops them from um, making use of their implants and it's like like read if you read about it understand it is a form of child abuse in a sense because they are um so isolated from their peers and their environments and being removed from that ability to express their feelings can cause lots of uh, obviously mental health issues and we follow the dual perspective of 
um, the headmistress of the school who is, takes Charlie under her wing and also talks a lot about those um, bigger issues within the home. She is a hearing child of a deaf parent um, and is the headmistress of the school, which is like such an interesting dynamic as well. And she's married to another woman and they um, have their own dynamic as well going on. So it's like lots of different relationships and ins and outs of all of these different people. and. At the core you're following Charlie as she learns sign language and immerses herself in this new school environment and then it takes quite an absurdist like um social justice warrior kids trying to stand up for themselves sort of take which I really enjoyed although it wasn't like wholly believable I just thought it was really well done and she falls in with this like slasher band group um and I really enjoyed all of that but at its core I just loved what it was saying about disability and deaf culture and the way that it manifests in adolescence and I'm not a big fan of reading about teenagers and children like I don't find it very interesting I thought this was so easy to read because of that perspective but I was so invested in their story and their lives and their relationships and I didn't don't get that a lot when I read um, books that have younger protagonists so I was really blown away by this story honestly I loved the way it was laid, laid out and for example there's a um, interaction it talks a lot about BASL so um, Black American Sign Language and the uh, conversations in the school about racism within the deaf community and there's insertions within the book of pages of the history of BASL and um, the story about segregation and sort of how um, BASL came to be and why sort of um, black deaf children benefited from having their own language and their own colloquialisms and I loved all of that and I thought that it was such a seamless um, immersion into deaf culture and the way that she merged um, history and fact and knowledge to educate a reader without putting it in your face or spoon feeding you or preaching to you I just thought it was all so seamless and I feel like I'm not articulating myself very well but it was such a brilliant read I loved it a lot okay then the rest of the books I have here to show you I read All My Puny Sorrows by Miriam Towers this is my second Miriam Towers book this one I got in a shop a long time ago and I was going to give it away but honestly Miriam Towers is becoming one of my favorite writers I'm just about to finish her newest novel Fight Night um that I'm reading right now but I haven't finished it in time for this month but um, Women Talking was one of my favourite books from last year and that still stays at the top but this comes a very close second. So we follow a um, pair of sisters, one is an internationally acclaimed suicidal, mentally unwell pianist, classical pianist and the other is the sort of um, average homemaking sister who doesn't struggle with their mental health, who is always considered the, who's the person that she calls every time she wants to end her life. This is explicitly a story about suicide and um, extreme mental ill health and suicide ideation. So if you're not interested in reading about this, then this is like very on the page, self-harm, self-deprecation, um, mental institutions and general mental ill health. So if that doesn't, isn't for you, then this book isn't for you. I would say like, it's not, um, there's no cotton wool here this is very explicit and I honestly found it extremely comforting to read a story so blatantly about suicidal ideation just like from a personal mental health perspective but I know that won't be for everyone um and I loved um I'm remembering the name Elf she is the classical pianist I loved there were so many parts in this I highlighted about Elf's experience of being talented at something but hating themselves so deeply and so much and being so afraid of messing up and losing these things and this pressure that everyone had built around her to be this world renowned pianist that people like she was a genius she was taken out of school she was like discovered at 17 and this story is grounded in men like culture because that is what Miriam Towers writes about and I believe that is um partially what she was raised in so there is this background knowledge of religion and religiosity and how that relates to music and how those two things of like music is considered like of the modern world and how that doesn't align with men like culture and how they were sneaking a piano into their house and the elders have such a problem with it and, and the history of mental illness within this family and within the Mennonite community and again how that like is considered ungodly to want to end your life and how um suicide and mental ill health is so poorly discussed within that specific religious community and I loved all of that you guys know I love religiosity and I love mental health so I just honestly couldn't couldn't have loved this more it was so 
comforting to read, which sounds so bizarre because it's so deeply bleak and depressing, but it really illuminated so many of those falsehoods you see when people write I think, think you can write about mental illness so poorly um particularly in like more contemporary literature I find time and time again that I like want to roll my eyes at the way people talk about certain things and want to romanticize them or although this was written beautifully there was no um there was no beating around the bush if you know what I mean um and I really, really loved it. My only complaint is I wish I had them all in the matching covers because I love the cover of Women Talking, although her latest book does not have those covers. So yes, I'm in the Miriam's House fan club. I will go on to read more of her books. One of my friends um, who works in publishing is also on the Miriam's House train. So um, she's been posting a lot of the books she's been getting from the library. So I will ask her which one I should head to next. Or if you have any guys have any suggestions, if you love Miriam's House, please let me know because I know her back catalogue is pretty um, extensive. Then I listened to, or a couple of these, I think you have seen me, you might have seen me vlog about all of these, so apologies. But I listened to, and this is Tom's copy I'm holding up, so I have to edit the picture in, The Mountain Sing. This is an intergenerational family saga about Vietnam. It's set between the 1950s and the 1970s, um, talks about the Vietnam War and the farmers' strikes and anti-landlordism and communism and the North-South divide. And I thought... For the most part, I really, really enjoyed it. It's really well narrated on audio. Highly recommend it. Listen to it on Scribd. And um, because there is um, occasional sentences or phrases in Vietnamese, to hear that intonation in the audio was really beautiful. And I thought the narration voice was um, really well done. I think perhaps I wouldn't have been so enamoured if I was reading it on the page. It's not typically my type of book. It's very... Like, this is a plot, this is a story, this is the characters, this is hardship, this is disaster. Like, quite formulaic in that sense. But um, the audiobook I found, like, weirdly soothing. Although it is, again, a bleakly, bleakly sad book. That at points I had to stop listening because so I was like, oh, I'm not, I don't want to feel this sad at this early in the morning. Because normally if I, like, can't sleep, I wake up at, like, five or six in the morning and I'll just listen to an audiobook for a couple of hours before I'm ready to get out of bed. I would, like, be playing this at, like, 5.30 in the morning and they'd be, like, travelling on this like 40 mile journey without shoes trying to feed their feed her kids and I would be like oh this is so depressing but um in terms of like historical um accuracy and discussions of like politics at the time I felt was really fleshed out and well developed and the scene setting of Vietnam was really well done and I think if just if I was really in person I would have felt like oh this is a long book but on audio I didn't feel that way at all and I also think perhaps some of the like overwrought metaphor and um like occasionally like did it make sense my have flower sentences went over my head for the most part because I was listening to it and on the page I would have maybe been more easily like irritated by it if that makes sense but on the whole really enjoyed it if you are a person who reads like these kind of epic books then this is definitely one for you to pick up and then I read a couple of Irish books that I loved. I read The Colony. I thought this was so brilliant. Again, one I actually switched between the audio and physical copy of. I read this really early on in the month. I think I vlogged when I read this as well. And this was so brilliant. It's set on a island off the coast of Ireland and it follows um, Mr. Mason and Mr. Lloyd. And they are two intruders to the island. One is an English painter and the other is a French linguist. The linguist is here to try and save the native tongue um, he is doing, he's like an academic and a research and he's doing his um, like thesis on the dying like Irish language within the island and tracking the uh, members who speak it and those who are passing it down through their lineage and the ones who are then choosing to speak English. And um, Mr Lloyd is a painter with an estranged wife and a like inflated ego who thinks that he can come onto the island and do what he wants. He's like very much representative of an English colonizer. But I loved the wit and the humour that went into this. It's very much a book about people talking um, and language on a meta sense is there because um, Mr. Mason is there to document the language. And he thinks that by Mr. Lloyd, the Englishman being there, he is um, diluting his like body of work and he is interrupting his research and you know causing harm to the island by speaking English and then you have this young witty wry character called James I want to say who is um a like grandson of the elders on the island and he is uh like decides that he wants to learn to paint and he also likes to speak English and has 
dreams of leaving the island and he doesn't want to become a fisherman which is what his like lineage of men and his family have done because that's how his father passed away and it's very much a story of matriarchs as well there's a really great um set of interactions between the older women and the um like the men who are the intruders i thought it was really interesting it intermittently um reports events from the troubles throughout that are received as the characters have people come and deliver things via boat and i really liked that detached style of reporting the author i think was previously a like quite a big um journalist and news reporter before she penned this novel and you can read how that journalistic turn of phrase in those reporting and it had that really detached style of news headlines and i thought that was a really clever way of illustrating the distance the island had from mainland island and what that sort of represented for these people who felt so um detached from the troubles in terms of like spatially and also culturally not necessarily having that um us versus them mentality in terms of religion but in terms of like their island and i thought that was already really well done and i recommend the audiobook as well thought it was brilliant and then another irish book which i adored which i think Lots of people commented on my last vlog that they were going to go and get this because I looked so happy talking about this. And I'm so happy to hear that you will go and get this because I adored this um, short story collection. This is Homesickness by Colin Barrett, his first collection called Young Skins. You should also buy and read. That set of collections, that set of stories is slightly more violent um, explicitly, although violence definitely runs through all of his writing. And it's more um, laser focused on masculinity. This one does have couple of stories that involve women and um as like central themes and, and a lot that are side characters in this like more communal sense of story whereas in the other one it's very like individual destitute and rageful characters although those themes are here too but I felt like this was much more stories of repression and community actually there was some really great stories in here about dysfunction in communities small town communities um Irishness and I had so much days of you reading this book. It's set in count. Most of the stories are set in County Mayo, and it um, one story is set in Canada, and it deals with themes like alcoholism, um, estrangement, uh, land ownership, destitution, dead end jobs, um, caregiving, and I think Colin Barrett just has such a sharp, biting like way of writing characters. They're so descriptive but with such little words they're so fleshed out you can see these men that they're writing walking down the street like I can picture their vans and um, I can picture their their outfits and their builders bums and like it, it's so well illustrated in here I cannot emphasize that enough and the stories have that certain twist of absurd to them and that makes them so colorful and just come off of the page that he um I don't know, I think he masters short stories so well because I like slice of life stories but you really need them to have a bite to make them memorable and he does slice of life with that like so absurd that it must be real because how could you make it up kind of thing like I was explaining in the vlog the story about the man who arrives in the local pub with this massive sword because he's killed his evil mum's cat and you're like that doesn't sound real but also someone somewhere probably has a story like that and yeah just honestly couldn't rave about that collection more. I'm in such a short story phase right now and this is definitely the reason that I've kicked that kicked that all off, if that makes sense. Then the final book I read, I was sent, I was just checking if I haven't sent the other ones, no, I bought all of those, this was the last book I was sent and it's 10 Steps to the Net by Hannah Gadsby. If you haven't watched Nanette, Hannah Gadsby is an Australian comedian and Nanette was her comedy special which was billed as I'm Quitting Comedy she takes down um rape culture within comedy male privilege and the idea of like what constitutes a joke and how like, like very behind the curtain how to make a comedy show funny how to bring an audience along with you why there is such a formulaic experience to these male comedians who rely on punching down so much and all of that is in here as well as the first nine steps in the net which are essentially her life up until she wrote that show and um, she talks about her childhood growing up in Tasmania she is a queer woman and she talks about that experience of being an outsider from a young age and also the um different bills that came into like public discourse during her adolescence like um legal 
marriage for LGBTQ plus people and lots of different law changes in Australia and how those affected her individually as well as like politically as like a group of um, vulnerable people and she spoke really candidly about experiences from some of her friends and just like sort of how that like emotionally impacted everyone and I really thought that those pieces particularly were well done. The other set of like exploration that she does is about her experience with ADHD and autism. She was uh, like late adult woman diagnosis of those two things which we know is very common because the signs of them are atypical or the structures we have to diagnose those um, conditions are modelled on maleness and boyhood so yeah she talks a lot about that in here and her own experience but I, although I have read a lot about that both for my undergrad and just my experience teaching I didn't find what she, I didn't find her I didn't find that she was bashing you overhead with the information she was just sharing her experience of um diagnosis and all of the signs she can reflect on now that made her realize that she was autistic and or had ADHD I thought that was really ooh, really well done a very good insight into atypical brains which I myself found really useful and comforting so would definitely recommend that as well I would say that probably watching the show first would give you more context as to who she is as a person but even without that as soon as I finished this I rewatched Nanette to remember how good it was and yeah I think she's funny and bright and witty and just seems like a really nice person so really enjoyed that one as well and those are the eight books I read in May couldn't even remember the month there thank you so much for watching I'll see you guys in another video soon bye bye